Oui. OK, so we're going to begin as usual with our summary of the portion. Um, it's a, quite an action-packed portion, lots of events. There's such a powerful storyline in all the portions of the Book of Breshit, particularly because they relate to family and the, the annals of the family of Jacob and, and his sons. So what begins this week is that Judah... Let me, let me just uh, mute everybody because that will make everyone be able to hear better. Um, so we ended off last week that uh, Joseph had framed his younger brother, ben Benjamin, Benjamin, he planted his goblet into his bag. And when they were now on their way back home, thinking everything had been resolved, they'd proven that they weren't spies. They had brought Jacob Benjamin as Joseph had requested to prove their innocence. And now they're on their way back home. Everything is cool. Everything is going perfectly well, but it wasn't because suddenly the men of Joseph come running after the brothers and they accuse them of having uh, stolen. They begin to open their bags. And lo and behold, the, the missing goblet is in the pack of Benjamin, unbeknown to him, planted there by Joseph's men himself. So they now taken back to Egypt. And now things are much worse than ever. They actually are involved in theft. And uh, Joseph says that he wants now Benjamin, who is the, the supposed thief, to now remain in Egypt. This is the opening point of, of this Shabbat's reading. And Judah gets up and makes an impassionate speech. He speaks about the fact that there's a connection between Father Jacob and the son Benjamin. And he must, Joseph must let Benjamin return to his father in the land of Canaan. He speaks about the love between Jacob and his son. And that if his son does not return, then Jacob's going to die. We'll come back to the speech because uh, supposedly how, 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 how will that impress Joseph, who they don't know is, his brother, is their brother. Um, so who cares about Jacob? But anyway, we're going to get back to, to Judah's speech. One of the most emotional, powerful speeches in, in the, I could say, in the Torah. Um, and he explains that he had personally, Judah had personally taken responsibility to bring Benjamin back home to, the, to his father and that he will not allow this to happen. And then he says, I will remain as a slave instead of Benjamin, but keep me, but send Benjamin. Benjamin has to go home. And um, we'll come back to what we explained last week as to why Joseph had delayed the revelation of his identity for so long. But it is at this point, this is the breaking point where Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. Can you imagine the emotion that surrounds them, the shame, the embarrassment, the, the emotions that they went through when he said, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? And then he switches gear, jo um, Joseph, and he says to his brothers, please do not fear. Do not think anything about the fact that you sold me and you almost killed me and you did all these terrible things to me. And these are very operative words that we're going to come back to. But it was to preserve life that God sent me before you. That's why I'm in Egypt. Then Joseph directs his brother to bring Jacob and the family down to Egypt where there's plenty of food. And Joseph promises to provide them with food until the famine ends. So this is um, uh, Joseph's speech to his brothers in return to, to, to um, Judah's speech. And then he embraces his brothers and he cries. There's actually a lot of times that Joseph cries um, in this whole book of, of Genesis. Then Para 2 instructs them to come back to Egypt and he would give them the two pirates, the best of the land. The brothers go to Klan, they're laden with gifts from Para and from Joseph, and you can now only imagine, we're not told in specific detail in the Torah, what went on when the brothers came to their father and said that your son Joseph is alive, and he's the ruler of Egypt, and he's the one who's now bringing us down to Egypt to be able to um, survive the drought. They informed Jacob that Joseph was alive and he was the ruler of Egypt and the spirit of Jacob was revived. En route, they stopped in Beersheba. God tells Jacob not to fear this journey down to Egypt. And in fact, he's going to become a great nation there. Hashem told him, I'll go down with you to Egypt, but, but I'll also go up with you. There is another side to this uh, Egyptian journey. You're going to come back up. And it then lists the 70 members of Jacob's family that went down to Egypt. 
and actually 69, a whole subject in its own right. And Jacob arrives in the province of Goshen that Pharaoh had allotted to the family. Um, Joseph went to greet his father. We can only imagine that, that um, encounter between Joseph and his father after all these many years. And Joseph instructs his brothers to tell Pharaoh that they are shepherds. They wish to tend to their flocks in Goshen until the famine ends. Um, this was uh, not considered uh, kindly by the Egyptians. Shepherds, they were more agricultural farmers. Um, but they asked to stay in their own distinct place in the land of Goshen until the famine ends. Pharaoh exceeds the brother's request. Jacob blesses him, blesses Pharaoh, Pharaoh. And while Joseph supplied his family with food, the rest of Egypt was languishing in a terrible plight. And it describes the various stages. First, they spent all of their money in exchange for food that Joseph sold them. Now they had no money, the, the, the inhabitants, the people of Egypt. And that ran out, he said, okay, pay me with your possessions. So the provisions that they kept with the cattle, they got all of their food in exchange. They bartered whatever they had less left in assets. And when all of those assets ran out, finally he said, okay, I'll give you food. But they sold their land and themselves to Paro as slaves in exchange for provisions. So basically now Joseph, second to Paro only, um, has enslaved, has the entire Egypt a slave to him. They completely beholden to him. Meanwhile, in the land of Goshen, Jacob's family prospered and multiplied exceedingly. Things were going well for the Jews in Egypt. But as we always know, that too is going to have a twist as we enter a week after next into the book of Shemot, the book of Exodus. So let's go through some of the messages that we can take out of this Shabbat's reading and how we can apply it to our own lives. So the word by Yigash, which is the name of the portion, by Yigash, he loved Yehuda, and jo Judah approached him. He approached Joseph. This is prior to um, Joseph identifying who he was. So they still think he is a, a very powerful ruler who's out to make their life miserable. And the rabbis in the Midrash actually bring the word by Yigash, as it appears in various verses around the Torah. And each of them has a certain connotation in, for, for which reason the word by Yigash is used. So Rabbi Yehuda says the word by Yigash connotes for battle. As in he brings a verse to show that by Yigash can mean to approach in battle. Rabbi Nehemiah says no, the word by Yigash in another place is used in, uh, in a conciliatory way. And therefore he approached him for conciliation. The sages, Chachamim said, no, the word by Yigash is used in prayer. So he actually approached uh, Judah while he was praying to God. And Rabbi Eliezer says he actually approached Joseph for all three. All three of you rabbis are right. He said, if it's for war, then I'm ready for war. If it's for conciliation, I approach you with conciliation. And if it be for prayer, then I approach in prayer. Just to stop for a few moments and to talk about the various approaches that Jews have had to uh, uh, go through when confronting the dangers of Jewish history. And there have been different circumstances. At times we've had to go out and fight and to be warriors and to be filled with war. At times we've stood in prayer to God and uh, held up our hands and, and uh, hearts to Hashem and said, Hashem, please help us. And at times we've done things that uh, are conciliatory. We try to make peace. Even when Jacob meets his brother Esau, we see that he sends him gifts um, and all kinds of uh, and um, uh, conciliatory um, processes to try and bring about peace between him and his brother. Um, at the same time, he approached Hashem in prayer, and on this occasion, even in war. So just three different approaches that we've at different times had to uh, reach for. When the Jews stood at the banks of the Red Sea with the Egyptian army chasing after them, we're told that there were actually four groups of Jews. And the, um, the call of the moment was to proceed. It wasn't prayer, and it wasn't war, and it wasn't even in, uh, trying to compromise with, with the enemy. But over here, the Midrash is implying that Judah was ready to do anything, anything. If I need to fight, I'm ready to fight. But that doesn't define me, because really, I believe in God, I'm ready to pray. But while I'm praying, I realize that I have to do what I can, so I'm ready to fight. I'm also ready to compromise and to do whatever I can to resolve and to bring about peace I'm looking for peace. I'm not looking for fighting. 
So these are the different uh, responses that Jews have had to do, and sometimes simultaneously to be ready to all of them. Even when the Jewish exile came back from Babylon, we told how when they were building the temple, they had swords in one hand and uh, the uh, building implements in the other hand. So they were building the house of Hashem, but they were ready for war at the same time. We haven't been allowed to simply choose how we want to live. We often framed by the, um, the approach of the enemy and, and what we need to do. So here the Midrash is telling us that Judah uh, responded in all of these different ways. And they actually um, tell, speak of the different approaches of the Jews throughout the ages. Um, I want to speak more about this uh, speech of Yehuda. It's one of the most powerful emotional speeches, and it turns the tide. He mentions his father no less than 10 times. He says, Avi, my father, my father, my father. He talks about his connection to his father, and this is all to impress the viceroy of Egypt. And what is actually happening is a total reframing of the predicament and a brand new approach. And let's try and take a message out of this. Until now, okay, they don't know that Joseph is their brother, that it's Joseph their brother. They think it's the vice of Egypt. Until now, they've been accused of lots of things. You guys are spies, prove that you're not spies. Okay, so we'll prove, we'll, we'll do exactly what you're saying and we'll prove that we're not spies. They bring their brother Benjamin, now they're thieves. Now they have to be slaves. And that he, they were constantly answering the questions as they are being framed by the enemy. That was happening until now. This was the first time that Judah takes himself away from the frame of reference that has been imposed on him. And now he speaks from his heart. He speaks from, as a Jew. He says, this is my story. I, I'm, I'm not answering the questions as you asking them. I want to tell you where I stand. And he moves into a totally different approach to the situation. He speaks about his love, his father's love for the child, the fact that he'd given his assurance, that he'd stand stood surety, and that he is ready to be the slave instead of his brother. He speaks in a way, as we just said, by Yigash, if you're not ready to work it out with me, I'm ready to go to war with you as well. And Judah was a very powerful individual. The Midrash says he thumped on the table and, and Egypt was uh, shaking. So he was a formidable person. He switched gear completely. Until now, they were answering all the questions as they were imposed on them by a viceroy of Egypt, or their brother who was presenting himself as a viceroy of Egypt, and nothing was working. It took a totally different approach when Judah says, this is the real story. Let me tell you where I stand. Let me tell you where the Jew stands. And that's the switch that moves into a whole different gear. If you think about the various complaints against the Jewish people through the ages, the enemies of the Jewish people are always framing the question. You guys are too rich, you're too poor. You're too left-leaning, you're too right-leaning. You're too socialist inclined, you are um, too involved with, uh, with, with making money. You are, they're always framing the questions. This is where the Jews fall short. And, and we often fall into the trap to answer the questions as they are framed by our enemies. And we think that if we bring the answer, they're finally gonna be satisfied. But we know that throughout the ages, as soon as we answer one complaint, then it moves to a different one sometimes the opposite one. So we're constantly in the frame of reference of somebody else who's framing the questions of the Jew. And that's what defines us. Our Jewishness is defined as our response to the questions that are launched against us by our enemies. And God forbid that could become how we define ourselves. This speech of Yehuda is a total turn. It is a new beginning. He thumps on the table and he says, I will not be defined by the questions. It is ridiculous. They, they are so absurd. If we look at what we have been through, we came to buy food and look what we have been accused of. Time and time again, a new allegation, new allegation. It is enough. This is where I stand. I want to define myself in terms of my obligation to my father, my, 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 the, the relationship of my brother to his father, the love, the other seemingly words that would have no bearing 
on an enemy such as the viceroy of Egypt. Who cares about your father's feelings? But it was only when Yehuda touched this core that everything changed. Okay, we know that it wasn't really the vice of Egypt. It happened to be Joseph. And we explained last week that the reason why Joseph had not revealed himself all the way through until this moment, very briefly, as we explained last week, was because if he did reveal himself sooner, the father Jacob would receive and be reconnected to the son whom he thought he lost. But simultaneously, he'd be alienated from 10 sons whom he thought he had as sons who had caused all of these problems and lied to their father about the fate of the brother um, Joseph. So it was only when he was able to bring the family to a point that Judah says this speech, which is now a reversal of all the attitudes that happened for decades and decades. This was the first time a Jew was facing the real reality. I am a Jew. This is Judah speaking. And this is what I stand for. And this is who I am. And this is what defines me. And I actually don't care for the questions anymore. This is who I am. It was when he, he stood by his brother Benjamin and said, I'm ready to be a slave in his place, that he could now bring the whole family together again. Because now Jacob would learn that although the brothers had behaved so badly years ago, they had repaired the damage right now. So there's the, the real story between Joseph and, uh, and the brothers, and Joseph knowing who his own identity. But if we take it outside of how Joseph was presenting himself, but how the brothers were perceiving the vice of Egypt, it certainly lends insight into what the answer of the Jew is to a world so full with questions about what the problems and the difficulties the Jews are bringing into the world. And if we're constantly answering the questions as they are presenting to us, and that becomes the definition of who we are, we are in a tragic trajectory of failure. We need to stand up and say, this is who I am really. This is my story. And when we do that, invariably, we have a different impact and different response in the society around us. One final point about the speech of, of Judah and the revelation at this time is that Barbanel, one of the classic commentaries from Spain, he was actually exiled from Spain, um, in the Inquisition, 1492. And he says that God deals with man measure for measure. We know this, midah connected midah, often mentioned in the Torah. And because Judah had sold Joseph into slavery, he had to reach the point where he was and compelled to offer himself to Joseph as a slave. So there was a technicality over here that that too had to be resolved. Judah had imposed slavery on Joseph and now had to resolve that by giving himself as a slave to his brother Joseph. Anyway, we know that at this point, um, sorry, still sticking with the speech of, of Judah, one more detail taken out of its simple meaning. In the speech, which we said is such a powerful emotional speech, he said, Judah says, how will I go up to my father? And my brother, the lad, the young boy, will not be with me. How can I go back to my father without the young lad Benjamin with me? This is still when Judah is uh, uh, venting and, 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 and giving over his emotions. So the commentaries have taken this verse out of its literal sense that Judah was saying, I've got to bring Benjamin back to his father. But there are two different um, connotations. The one is, this replies to each and every one of us every day. How can we approach our father, referring to our father in heaven, Hashem, if we are not caring for the young lad, meaning for each other, his children? So taking this verse out of its literal context here, at this juncture of revelation between Jew Joseph and his brothers, but as a general statement, such a powerful verse, the words having such deep connotation, how can I go up to my father in heaven? How can I talk to my father? How can I pray to God? And the lad is not with me. When the children of God, when my brothers and sisters are not with me. That it is an essential ingredient in our approach to Hashem to have our brothers and sisters with us. If we care for one another, it is the greatest passport to being able to speak and approach our Father in heaven. A second connotation outside of its literal meaning, how can I meet my maker, refers to a Jew who might be completing his time in this world or thinking about that point, 
how will I ever meet my maker at the end of this lifetime if I have not impacted on the young, on the next generation? How could I ever meet my maker at the end of my life? By now in any teeth, I haven't impacted on the youth, on the next generation, on the children. Where do my children stand in their relationship with Hashem? So definitely not the simple meaning of the verse, but a very powerful insight and message that we're taking. How can we ever meet our father in heaven at the end of life if we haven't given our utmost to inculcate and to share and to um, enthuse our children with the values that are so important to us. It's not good enough if the Zayda was a very, very pious and, and religious Jew. It was what happened to children and grandchildren. And that has to be so much a part of our concern and emphasis in life. Okay, moving on. Um, so we said at this point, at the end of this very powerful speech of Yehuda, which is so filled with the, the different modes, uh, prayer and, and war and reconciliation and emotion, and as we said before, the reframing of, of the Jewish response, it's this point that Joseph could not restrain himself. That had come, the moment had come to reveal his identity, as we've just explained, why, with, why this was the moment, why this speech, this not just speech and saying nice fineries, not delivering a speech, but finally talking from his heart and soul, this is the moment that changes everything. Now, Joseph says, every man in this room has to leave. So no man stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Rashi gives a very simple explanation that he didn't want to embarrass his brothers in front of all of the Egyptians. So he sent everybody out and then he revealed himself to his brother. He didn't want to put his brothers, um, embarrass them in front of all of the Egyptians. But I want to share a, a deeper thought about the privacy of very special moments. That bearing, oh, it's a, the wrong spelling. When we bear our soul, it has to be a private encounter. It's not a Kodak moment. And I want to share a few thoughts about how the world generally relates to the most precious, most significant moments in life. We immediately call a press conference. This is normally done in, in the media. It's, it's normally, we, it's now Twitter, and we're able to share that on Facebook immediately. And the most personal, important, and powerful moments are evaluated by how many people saw, how many friends, how many people commented. It's all about the people around one. But the power of a moment has to be evaluated in its personal, private effect. And therefore, we might notice that Joseph sends everybody out because this was a very powerful moment. We can only imagine the connection between brothers after all these years. But it had nothing to do with a display. It had nothing to do with impress in making an impression. It had nothing to do with how many people would be watching. In fact, it had to be done in private. And the cue that I'm taking is that uh, soon we'll learn back in the book of Ayikra when we're building the sanctuary, so one of the, the last implement, in fact, outside of its, uh, what should have been its place to be listed amongst all the vessels created in the sanctuary, in the, sanctuary the, the, the Mizbech HaKatoret, the altar on which incense was brought, is mentioned in the Torah at the end of all the clothing, which is a totally separate section of Tetzaveh. It seems completely out of place. It is one vessel that is held over to right at the end of all of the details of the sanctuary. Then we talk about this golden altar where they brought the incense. And, and one of the commentaries is because in that service of the incense, it says, adam lo yeh, and no person should be there. It was a private moment. It was a moment between the Kohen and Hashem. And the Hasidus explains that the emphasis of that is you have all the fanfare of the sanctuary. You have the gold and the silver and the beauty and the wonderful uh, protocols and, 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 and the details of how the operation took place in the sanctuary. Yes, there were a lot of things that had to happen. But in the final analysis, what was it all about? A private moment between the Kohen and Hashem. All the fanfare, all the excitement, all the, the inspiration that we're always looking for, the, the real critical evaluation of its power and effect is how deeply we feel that within ourselves. 
without anyone else being there. Let take everyone else out of the equation. Where do I stand in my private moment between myself and Hashem? So in a sense, the same words are used. No man shall be there. He sent everybody out of the room because Joseph was saying, this is a most private, personal, significant moment. It has nothing to do with how many people are watching. This has nothing to do with impressions. This has to do with where I stand on the deepest level between me and my brothers at this time. So he reveals himself to his brothers and um, and now we get to the point that I actually advertised for the shir, which if we just left with one thing from the shir this evening, it would be this important message. Jo Joseph reassures his brothers and he says, please don't worry and don't think that I'm harboring anything in my heart because it's not because of you that I'm in Egypt, but rather Hashem Shlochani, God sent me, Lemichya, to provide sustenance. That's why I'm here in Egypt. Let me tell you why I'm in Egypt. You think I'm in Egypt because you sold me as a slave so many years ago, and for that reason, I'd be harboring in my heart so much enmity and, uh, and uh, vengeance and anger and, and, and emotion against you. No, no, that's not the reason I see myself in Egypt. Why was I sent to Egypt? I was sent by God to Egypt to provide sustenance. I'm here for a reason. So I want to talk about what I've highlighted in red. In every situation in life, we can define that situation by us being a victim of the circumstance. I was sold. I was betrayed by my brothers. This is what happened to me. Or a totally different evaluation of the situation in terms of I'm here because I have a mission and a purpose that I have to achieve. That's the reason I'm here. And that's what Joseph was saying to them. If you think that I see myself being in Egypt, having been a slave uh, and a servant, and then being in jail, and then languishing, and, and all the service that he'd been through, sold out by his brothers. If you think that I have been living all of these years just recounting the fact that look what a victim I am. Look what's happened to me. Look how people, I'm going to make them, I'm going to take revenge. I'm going to, they're going to suffer because of what they did to me. So every day he would be defining himself in terms of what the brothers did to him. But Joseph says something so profound. I'm not living there. I haven't lived there. That's not how, how I have defined why I'm here in Egypt. I know that I'm here in Egypt for a purpose. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. God sent me here for a purpose. And thank God I worked out what the purpose is. And that is what we see unfolding, that I have brought food to the entire region. That's why I am here. I'm not here because of you. I'm here because of God. Your accountability for whatever you did you, between you and Hashem. But me, I am not defining myself by what you did to me and that I am the victim of what happened to me through you. I'm here for a proactive purpose and mission. Now, this is a remarkable reevaluation of circumstances in this world. Think how often we look at the situations that confront us and we see ourselves as victims. That is the most natural response of a human being. Look what has been done to me. How am I supposed to survive this when so many people are guilty and caused so much pain? And this one is the reason and that one's the reason and, and they are real. We could be saying that look at all the financial loss this year because of COVID. Look at the loss of life because of COVID. Look at this year has done to us in terms of the emotional separation of families and terrible, terrible tragedies. But, but, and it's true, this has happened to us. But the ability to say at, what, at some point that I am at this place not because I'm a victim of all the things that happened to me. What is Hashem wanting me to achieve by going through all of these circumstances? What is the challenge? What am I supposed to accomplish and achieve out of this? You see, the difference between a victim and a shaliach on a mission is, is worlds apart. 
I'm not the end point of some design that has nothing to do with purpose, but I am simply a victim of chance. That is a painful, terrible place to be. It results in so much debilitation. The moment that we're able to look at the situation in life and say, I am not just the end result of what happened to me. I am a purpose. I am the purpose that God is giving me this moment in exactly this situation at this time. This is what I'm meant to go through and this is what I'm meant to achieve. That is the most empowering, powerful analysis of life. I am not just here like a leaf in the wind floating around in the tragedies that have surrounded me. I am here for a purpose. Let me discover what that purpose is. What can I do? What is Hashem wanting me to achieve in this moment? Who can, whose life can I touch? Who can I lift up? How am I able to bring light into this world? What am I supposed to be doing with this moment? That's the challenge. And that is a redefinition of life itself. As I said before, human beings generally tend to define ourselves as victims. This is what has happened to me. That's the story of our life. You know what happened to me and this is what this person did to me. And, and, and we live with somebody else taking space in our heads. As, as, as somebody once said, rent free. They live in our heads for years and years because this is how we evaluating our lives in terms of what they said and they did and what was done. The, 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 ter the terrible situation that I'm in because of everything else around me. The a moment, I don't know why my connection is not so stable. I hope it's coming back in. Um, the moment that we're able to switch and to say, I am not here because of you and you and you and you. Yes, you guys did things that caused me to be in Egypt, says Joseph. But that's not how I define my life. Kim Hashem Shlochani, God sent me. I have a mission. I have a purpose. It is a total redefinition of who I am. There is meaning in this moment. I'm not just the end point of somebody else's decision. I have a mission in this moment. If we leave, we leave the tonight with any message that we can take from the portion of Ayigash, it is Joseph's evaluation of his life. And he could have had so many complaints. As we mentioned last week, he was orphaned. From, from by his mother passed away when he was very young. Then he's hated by his brothers who are jealous of him. Then he's eventually sold, almost killed by his brothers. And then all the stories that happened to him in Egypt. This would be a prime case for any psychologist to explain how this child does not stand a chance in life. Look at all the circumstances that surrounded this person. This person is a tragedy about to happen. And Joseph is the most successful leader, the most powerful individual who impacts on the whole society, the whole environment around him. And the core issue, if you want to say what was the critical issue that made the difference, that made Joseph as powerful as he was, was this one different reading. He never, in spite of all of the darkness of his life, he never defined himself in terms of what happened to me because of others around me. I'm not just floating in somebody else's world. I have a mission. What is my mission? If we could wake up in the morning and say to ourselves, yes, this is painful, this is difficulty, this is a health problem, this is a money problem, this is an emotional problem, this is a family problem, these are the problems, these are all the things that I have to contend with. But rather than simply listing all of the reasons that we could define ourselves as victims, say, so what is the mission? What is the purpose that I've been put into this situation? What can I do with it? If th that is the complete game changer in terms of, of uh, success and failure in life. It's how we view the predicaments that we are in. Let's see if we can still carry on with a few more thoughts before we uh, uh, complete the, the share. So now what happens is when he reveals himself to his brothers, the verse describes that he fell on the next doesn't make sense in the English translation, but the word is in plural, of his brother Benjamin, and he wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. So the interesting thing is that why does it speak about the plural necks of Benjamin 
And Benjamin worked on his singular one neck. And how many necks does a person have? So the, the Midrash tells us that it actually alludes to the two temples that would be subsequently built in the portion of Binyamin. The, 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 the portion of Yerushalayim was in the section of Binyamin. And both temples would be destroyed. So while they were weeping because of the emotion of the moment, they were also weeping about subsequent events in history where there was going to be two temples destroyed in the portion of Binyamin. On the other hand, Binyamin cries on the singular neck of, uh, jo of Joseph because that's where the sanctuary at Shiloh prior to the building of the Beis Amigdash was. And that was built in the portion of Joseph. So he built, he, he wept on the necks, plural, because of the two temples. And he wept on the neck in the singular because that was the portion of Joseph where, where, the, where the sanctuary of Shiloh was built. So I want to just stop a point and say, what, what's the connection between neck and a sanctuary? We're talking about a temple and a sanctuary and the biological, the physiological part of the human, the anatomy of the human body that represents the temple is the neck. So that's just the, the Midrash is, is, is saying that, but why? Why would the neck be representative of the temple? I would imagine that the highest point of the world is the temple and the highest point of a human anatomy is the head. So the head should represent the temple. Why would we refer to the neck? So just a thought about how the Jew views the highest point of holiness. So we are taught that the neck is a very narrow strait of the body, but it includes in it Gakana, Vaishat, and Vrid. You have the, the wind pipe, you have the food pipe, and you have the blood pipe. The, the major, major arteries of the human body is the neck. In fact, uh, when, when, when one's uh, aware of how animals kill in, in, the, in the game reserve, they always go for the neck. The neck is, is the place. The neck is the most uh, vulnerable and the most vital point in the body because that is the place where the head sends its messages down. The blood goes through there, the, the impulses of the brain go through there, everything goes through the neck. So just an imagery of what we see as the great holiness of the temple is not the highest point. If it was the fact that it was the highest point in the world, if holiness means being at the highest point of spiritual achievement by moving to the highest point away from this world, then truly the anatomy of the body that would better represent the temple would be the head. But what is in actual fact um, the, the, the true um, um, purpose of the temple is to affect, is to affect the world. So the, the part of the body that best represents the temple is in fact the net, because holiness as we view it as the Jewish people is not detached holiness, is not holiness removed, is, is elevating higher and higher and higher, and then you reach the highest point and now you are completely above. Holiness as we define it as a Jew is applied holiness, is holiness how it impacts, how it affects, how it is able to generate itself down back into the body. The power of the head, the highest part of the body, is actually evaluated by how it's affecting the rest of the body. So that's a general evaluation of holiness. Like we always say that Shabbat is the holiest part of the week. And therefore you go Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Yom Shishi, Friday, and then you go to the highest point of Shabbos. But in actual fact, the highest point of Shabbos is its ability at Havdalah to take the spiritual dimensions of Shabbos and we name is Barchin Kula Yomin, we affect the beauty of the week that lies beyond with the experience of Shabbos. We don't reach a high point and that's it. Now that's the end. And now let's see what next week brings. No. The, the next week is a continuation. The continuation of the highest point of holiness of last week is the stepping stone of enthusing the next week with that spirituality and then building towards the next chapters. So it's just a, a redefinition of holiness from our point of view. The greatest holiness is not Yom Kippur in the holies of holies. True, that was the holiest place on earth. But in terms of human experience, what was the greatness of Yom Kippur? 
Mimochras Hashem, it was the day after Yom Kippur was when we got the commandment to build the sanctuary. And I always think at the end of Yom Kippur, when we dive in our simple Mairi that we do every single night of the whole year, and everyone's running from the shul to get their first drink of water, and everyone's running, please God, in shul. We should only be in shul for Yom Kippur, that everyone's like rushing and running. That Mairi of service is like the first opportunity to apply such a spiritual day of Yom Kippur into the first experience of the mundane, of the regular, of our regular week. That's the transition point. That, that's where the Yom Kippur is applied. It's not just achieved. We achieved this great holiness. How are we going to apply it? So interestingly, when we want to use a part in the human anatomy to represent the temple, it's not the head, which is the highest point. Because the temple was a means of affecting the entire world with getlachat, with godliness. It was a means, an instrument of bringing holiness into this world. It was the neck, because the neck is the means of bringing all of the power of the brain and, and everything that is generated in, in the head down to the rest of the body. That's why it was the neck. Okay, there's actually more to be said on that verse, but let's see if we, we, we finish and maybe we'll come back to a further point on that. So we spoke about the neck. On the way, on the way down to Egypt, we've got a few minutes. So they passed by Be'er Sheva on the route and route to, um, to the land of Egypt. Rab Nachman says, why did they go past Egypt? No, sorry, Be'er Sheva on the way to Egypt. Why did they go to Be'er Sheva? So the Midrash Rabbah says that he went to cut shoots from the cedar trees, which his grandfather, Abraham, had planted in Be'er Sheva. And these cedars were used for the construction of the sanctuary in the desert. So it's like an interesting thing. Remember, he's on the way down to, to Egypt to meet his son, and, to, and there's a lot of emotion, but he stops. He stops to take shoots of the cedar trees, and these cedar trees were used later on to build the sanctuary in the desert. And the, the Rebbe says that Jacob was going down into Egypt, he was going down into this exile, and he knew that there needed to be constant instruments of hope through the darkest moments of Egypt that were yet to come, in the servitude and the slavery of being in, in Egypt for 210 years in the darkest slavery. How did they endure? They endured because they looked up and they saw the cedar trees, not um, normal trees growing in Egypt. They saw the cedar trees and they said, how did the cedar trees come here? And they were reminded that our father Jacob, on his way down to Egypt, he brought the shoots of those cedar trees. He planted them here so that one day when we leave Egypt, we will build a sanctuary. And our father Jacob has given us the means and the wherewithal, the power to be able to build that sanctuary that lies beyond the darkness of Egypt. So there's a lot of imagery, a lot, a lot it represents so much. What did our grandparents do to be able to plant the seedlings to, to ensure that their experience of the past would be known and passed on to generations to come. That the role of Jacob was to say that although we would go through the most terrible situations of Galut, of exile, we would always live with hope, the Shana Babi Rushalayim. That we would always see that which our parents bequeathed us, that reminded us that there is a future, that there is that there is a Mashiach that we are awaiting to redeem this world, that the world isn't defined by what we see right now. And for 210 years of the darkest years in Egypt, this is what they looked at, the cedar. And, and the Rebbe explains that technically they could have found wood and there were merchants and they could have found places and they could have sent and miraculously they were given everything else in the desert. They could have been miraculously given the wood with which to build the sanctuary in the desert once they uh, went through the exodus. But it was about the 210 years in, in the darkest moments of exile that they would know that they had the wherewithal. We have the reserve. We have the means by which to rebuild. We're not here in the darkness of Galut as a cul-de-sac, as an end. There is hope. And Jacob, on his way down to meeting his son after all these years, what does he have on his mind? I'm going to Egypt. How do I take the instruments of hope that are going to stand with them even after I pass on from this world that they're still going to have the means of hope for a better tomorrow. That was the special message that Jacob was doing by stopping in Be'er Sheva at that point. I think I have one final slide 
two. The one is that Judah goes before all of the brothers. He goes down to, to, to Egypt. He sent before him. He sent Judah before him to Joseph to show the way Lahorot, um, to show him the way to, to the, to, as, as they went down to Goshen. The word Lahorot, to show the way, also means to teach. And therefore, we are taught in the Midrash that Judah was sent ahead to set up a base Midrash, to set up a house of study, Lahorot, from the word Torah, where he would teach Torah and where the sons of Jacob would read the Torah. Our survival tool, our commitment to study and to live the Torah that is found in Jewish education is the means by which we survive. So what did the Jew do before he went down into Egypt? The first thing he said was set up a yeshiva. Not the last thing, not the afterthought to once I'm settled and I have all of my physical things in place, then I'll worry about building a yeshiva. Before they came down to Egypt, there was already a yeshiva in Egypt set up by Yehuda, sent by his father ahead of time, to be, so that when they would arrive, they would already have the structures of learning. Torah learning was the survival tool. And the final point that I, I want to share with you is remembering that when Joseph and, and Benjamin meet, they fall on each other's necks and they cry, and we said the reasons why it was, in this case, it says, Joseph harnessed his chariot and he went to meet his father and he fell on his neck and he wept on his neck. Who's, Joseph wept on his father's neck. But different to the previous verse, it says nothing about Jacob falling on Joseph's neck and crying. We only see Joseph crying, but not Jacob. He, he, he wasn't. So Jacob was not, did not embrace and kiss Joseph. Our sages tell us that he was busy reading the Shema. Now just try and figure that out in your head. Try and figure out how in this all-important moment, finally, they were like, this is the, the moment of stepping on the moon. This is like the moment a father and child are going to meet. And he says, one second, I'm busy, Shema Yisrael Hashem, okay? he's busy saying Shema, he's davening. He's caught up in davening in this critical moment. He couldn't daven a moment earlier or a moment later. This is the moment of meeting your son. So the Hasidic masters explain that such was the level of Jacob that he had never experienced the emotions and the joy and the deep source feeling in his soul that he felt at that moment, that he was reunited with his son. And in keeping with wanting to give the best of what we have to God, to our experience with God, Jacob said, I will never have a moment so filled with emotion in life in life this this is the critical moment i want to take the emotion of this moment and dedicate that to to hashem so it's a very powerful insight that to, for jacob to be able to in the midst of all of his personal feelings and connections to his son to be able to say i'm dedicating this moment to hashem i believe in god it was not a powerful emotional moment outside of his relationship with God, but he actually utilized that feeling and that sensitivity, the deep feeling that he had for his connection to Hashem. Something to think about, certainly beyond our regular reach, but that every moment of life, even the most precious moments, should have some method of channeling the strength and the intensity of that moment to our relationship to Hashem. Okay, I've overstepped my mark, I definitely have. I really thank everybody for joining from all the different places, wherever you might be on holiday or on vacation, as far afield as, as uh, Sydenham or Linksfield or uh, Cape Town or wherever you might be. Enjoy the break and please God, let's get together on the other side of it uh, with strength and we should endure and pull through the wave, mm -hmm. the second wave, mm -hmm. and we should see ourselves not as the victims of what's happened to us, we're on a mission. We're all on a mission. We have a mission. We've got to discover it, and let's make it happen. Have a beautiful week. and the Rav's Madrich just got married two hours ago. Bernie. Uh, we should wish him a Chaim Tovim and Barakha Shalom. Chaim Tovim and Shalom to Bernie. I'm so happy for him. Chaim Tovim and Barakha two hours ago. Okay, Rav. So I thought I'd just get it in. Sorry Thank to you. hijack. No, I'm, I am in touch with Bernie through my sister in Israel, who's close to Bernie, so I was aware that he's getting married. Mazel tov. Ah. Smachot. Only Are you aware? Times. Sorry. Ah, okay. 
Not sorry. No, Let's share brakuł. good news. Okay. Let's share only good news. Okay. Okay. No, Thank no, you to you... all the people that have joined. No, Felicity, I didn't welcome you before, no. and Sam. No. And Thank you for joining. Aline, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. God bless. Okay, thank you, Rabbi. Yeah. Thank you.